Great to be here again. I, I enjoyed my last time when I was here. And uh, the last time I was here was in the hotter weather and the auditorium air conditioning didn't work. So I'm pleased to see that you rectified that because I got up this morning and we had snow flurries. You probably saw them too, didn't you? Isn't it, doesn't it feel like it's too early for all of that? I'm really glad to be back here today. I'm aware of the events of what just happened in this last week. And um, I, I, I want to say that as an organization, Venture Church Network, the Conservative Baptists, of which you are a part in this region, we all ache for you. This, is, um, this was not what you were hoping to hear. Uh, 140 or 50 of you gathered last week to vote for a man, and he overwhelmingly received your vote, and um, for personal reasons, he felt it necessary to turn you down. And so we stand with you. We are praying for you. We're going to help you in any way that we can. Um, we're going to help your search team as they continue the search. And although it's easy for me to say because I'm the outsider, um, God has something great for you because we all wear his uniform. On our sleeve, it says Jesus follower. That's the, the insignia that we wear. And so you have God's approval and stamp of approval for this place. He's not done with you yet. He's just making you be a little more patient. Uh, I want to thank uh, Zach and Caleb and Ken for being my hair and makeup people again today. Thank you very much for taking good care of me, making sure that I can be heard and that I look as good as I'm able to look while I'm up here. Thank you for that. I also come uh, with greetings from all of the other 93 churches or so that are in the organization to which you belong. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad for your long years of service with you. I'm going to have my sermon on a PowerPoint. If that doesn't work, I have it printed up here, and so I'll just hold this up and, and let you follow along from here. How's that? I'm going to be uh, talking about something today that uh, probably almost everyone in the room has heard before. There's a real danger in preaching sermons that, from passages that people well know, and this is one of them. And, and you heard it just read to you. It was from Luke chapter 15. And so uh, on your device or on your Bible or your tablet, whatever you brought to church, open your tablet, device, Bible to Luke chapter 15. And what I hope to do today is to give you kind of a, a fresh look at this. Um, we've all heard this preached before. Usually when it's preached, it's preached from a particular viewpoint and it comprises in this particular story, it comprises three components, a father, an older son, and a younger son. So we have two brothers and a dad. And you've heard it probably most of the time preached from the standpoint of the little brother. He gets most of the airplay in this story. I'd like us to look at this from a different angle today. And... Uh, it has the added benefit of this was the angle that Jesus was actually aiming at. We'll dig into that in just a minute, but what I'd like to do now is stop for a minute and pray that, that we'll all see this, because this is really for all of us. And all of us now in this particular time at Abundant Life Baptist Church, this is relevant for you, and it's relevant for me, and I'm going to ask God to help us see this. Would you pray with me? Good. Father, I, we need your Holy Spirit to illuminate our hearts and to allow us to see and hear things from your eternal word, which is always true, never changes. It will never change. We're not going to try to make a change or, or be something different than what it is. But by your Holy Spirit, I'm asking that you would use this passage to light up our brains, to let us see and hear things that perhaps we're not used to thinking of, but we're definitely in Jesus' mind as he was sharing this story. And so we need your Holy Spirit to, to do that. I'm asking for his help today, both for me and for those who are listening. I thank you for this place. I thank you that you have been sturdy and steadfast with them through these last two and a half or three years when things have sometimes been not pleasant. You are still the steady and ever-dependable God and I'm appealing to that God this morning for all of our sake. 
and I'm thinking and praying this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, guys, uh, I don't see a screen in front of me. Oh, there's one there. Uh, I'm calling this a tale of two brothers. Now, I told you before that I come from a whole bunch of brothers, and since I was here, my youngest brother died. He was only 60, died of cancer, um, and it really made a dent on all of us brothers because we were always like this group, and no matter where we were in the world and no matter what we did, we, we knew that we had each other. And um, this is the first time that we've actually been dented. And so my little brother has flown off to heaven since I was last year. And I'm glad to be able to report that he had a sturdy faith in Christ. And I'm able to say by the truth of Scripture and by its dependability that my brother is now in heaven waiting for the rest of us to get there. You'll get to meet him when you get there. Uh, he'll be the one with the big smile on his face. So this is, though, a tale of two brothers from this passage. Uh, if we go to the, the next screen, this is the passage that we're, we're working in. You heard it read to you. I'm not going to go back and read it the whole way, but I will reference it as we, as we go. If we could have the, the next screen, these are some things that I, I want you to, to see about this kind of as a, as a backstory. First of all, how many have heard this preach before in some way or other? That's most everybody. How many are aware that the portion of this chapter we skipped talks about a lost coin and a lost sheep? Everybody know that? Most of you do. Okay. The first thing we need to understand is that this is a parable. It's a story told by Jesus. And we think of this as three different parables. We, we think of this as the parable of the lost coin, the parable of the lost sheep, and now the parable of the lost son, or maybe your Bible says the prodigal son. You may have heard it that way. Actually, this is one parable. This is one parable about lost things. The listeners in that day understood that. They didn't hear it as three separate stories. They heard it as, if you will, a stage play that has three acts in it. One play with three acts, and Jesus talks about a lost coin, a lost sheep, and he saves this part of the act for last. So it's one parable, it's told in three sections, and the people that would have been listening to this got it. In our day, not, not so much. We, we tend to divide things up a little differently in our Western way of thinking, but they got it, and they knew it was one story that talked about lost things the second thing that you have to understand about this story is that it's directed at Pharisees. The Pharisees by now have heard some things about Jesus, and they've heard enough to know that they don't like him. First of all, they've heard rumors that he's an illegitimate bastard son. They know that. But no one of them can remember, where, where did he go to seminary? I don't remember him in school. I don't remember him in Jerusalem. I don't remember him studying under somebody great. It's, it's a carpenter's son, and an illegitimate one at that. And he's from up north. And up north in Israel was kind of looked down upon, kind of the way Juniata County looks down on Perry County. I was just out there preaching, and if you know that area, that's true. I don't know why. They seem to not like each other much. Uh, it reminds me of a Dallas Cowboys fan walking into the Philadelphia Eagles stadium. That's a big mistake, especially if you're wearing their gear. By the way, we're having a great time on my side of the state celebrating the Philadelphia Phillies and the Philadelphia Eagles, and we over here have the Steelers and we have the Pirates. <laughs> Your day will come back once again. You are my second favorite team because you're in my state. The Pharisees did not like this guy. They don't know a lot about him yet, but what they're starting to do is wherever his teaching, a group of them are getting together and they're going and they're listening. And they're listening for, why is this guy drawing the kinds of crowds that he is? How is he doing it? We don't like it. They don't come to synagogue for us. They, they don't sit in rapt attention all around us. Wherever we're gathered, they're not gathering around us. In fact, they're going the other way. What is it about this guy that people are drawn to him? Well, we know what it is. Those of us who are Jesus followers, we know because he's offering words of life. They are offering words of restriction, of duty, 
of obligation of keeping 700 and some odd Old Testament laws or you'll be in trouble with God. They set the standard. Not only do they have all these rules they want their people to keep, but they enforce them. We, we have something called church discipline when things get to a point in churches, but their idea of discipline was really a lot more rugged. You could be flogged. You could be extra ostracized. You, you could be excommunicated from the church. You could be publicly humiliated. You could be beaten in public. Now, if you doubt me about beatings in public, all you have to do is go on the internet and see another world religion called Islam, and in places where Islamic law is practiced, it's common for roving bands who belong to the mosque to publicly beat a woman because she doesn't have her head covered or because she's out without a man escorting her. It's happening today. That kind of stuff happened back then with the Jewish people. They had the same little gangs of people that represented the synagogue who would inflict, at the very least, great public shame on people and, at the worst, a beating or perhaps even ultimately a stoning if you didn't keep all these laws or if you got sideways with the Pharisees. So the Pharisees are there to check this guy out. And Jesus is sharing with them about lost things. And so the audience of this parable is really the Pharisees, the people who want, they want to figure him out because ultimately we learn later that they become his enemy and they want him dead. And they tried on several occasions before they finally succeeded. And when they did kill him, they thought, that's that for that. We don't have to worry about him anymore. The God of heaven had a different idea. He knew that he would raise his son from being dead, dead, not asleep, not in a swoon, not unconscious, not in a coma. He was dead. But they're here to check him out. And Jesus sets this whole three-act stage play and sets it in front of them for them to learn something. And the something that he has set in front of them is what we're going to look at today. The third thing that you see right away that everybody knows that's heard this before is the hero of the story is dad. The hero of the story is the father. And even the Pharisees got that. As it was being told, they got that. That was never at issue. That was never at question whether or not they would understand that the father in the story is the hero. What they were confused about, though, was the two brothers, and that's what we'll take a closer look at today. So what I would like to, to do is to look at three quick snapshots of each of the, the compelling figures, each of the stage actors, the dad, the older brother, and the younger brother. So let's start with the, the younger brother. We don't know how old he is. He's grown up in the family business. My guess would be that dad has some money. My guess would be that this is a farm or a vineyard, or something that has to do with growing crops because of what we read about the older brother being out in the field. I'm guessing that this is a pretty prosperous farm. Um, I'm guessing that based on what we're reading and from other things that we know of the time period and what was going on at that time. So in the story, the younger brother, the younger son, comes to the father and he says, divide the estate, give me what's mine, I'm out of here. This is a seriously, seriously insulting thing that this younger brother has done, this young son of the father. This is insulting no matter what. When I was here last time, I, t I told you that I have three grown daughters, and I do, I still do. They are 44, 42, and 40. They're married. Uh, our middle daughter has the children. They live 267 feet away from us. It's a terrific thing. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, God engineered all that. I didn't. But uh, the grandparents are exceedingly happy that this is so. I can assure you that when my children were in high school or college, if any one of them had come to their mother and I and said, uh, Dad, uh, I want you to figure out what my inheritance is. I want you to give it to me because I'm out of here. In the words of my mother, who was not a believer until later in her life, she would have looked at that daughter 
And I would have repeated what she said, and I would have said, daughter, you have another think coming if you think that you're leaving here with a bunch of money just because you asked for it. This is a really cheeky thing for this, this son to, to do. And we see what happens. Dad, the gracious dad, gives him his portion of whatever the inheritance should have been. Now, he's the younger brother. He's not going to inherit the farm. In Jewish culture, that always went to the eldest son. That was never at issue. But what the father would have done is he would have figured out a monetary value that would have been equal and divided whatever the monetary value would be in half to give this to his younger son. It is still a really thing to do, don't you think? I mean, that, that takes, it, it's worse than nerves. That takes guts to do what he did, and he was foolish. But the father, the father knows that there's something in his younger son that has to break free and just get out. And the father has sense enough to know that he can't make his son stay, and he can't make his son be the respectful, dutiful older son that he has that's running the farm. So he divides the inheritance and he gives the son what he wants. And you heard the story. He goes out to a faraway country and he lives a very sinful, the dictionary would call it a very licentious lifestyle. He's chasing wild women. He's doing crazy things. In our parlance today, he's doing drugs and hanging out with the wrong people and he's chasing skirts and winning. In our day, that's what it would be. And for those of you who have raised teenagers in 20-somethings and 30s, I have, there are moments in our children's li lives where they're choosing and doing things that don't exactly please us, right? In fact, they, they scare us. They get involved with things that worry us. And sometimes our children get so sideways that we wonder, will we ever get them back? Will they ever come back? Will they ever come back to being those sweet people we knew when we were raising them growing up. This father knows he has to let his son go because he's going to have to learn the hard way, and he does. And we've read and we've heard how this son, ultimately in this faraway place, ends up squandering all the money, and all the women that he's had have all left, he can't pay off his drug supplier because he still has no money, and he's got to go to work for a pig farmer feeding pigs. Now, for a Jewish person to be reduced to the level of having to work with pigs is a high, high insult because you know how Jewish people felt about pigs, right? They don't eat ham. They don't eat scrapple. They don't eat pork roll. They don't eat bacon. More is the pity because I'm a German. <laughs> but... They don't have anything to, to do with pigs. And yet he's reduced to having to feed pigs. And more than that, he's not even earning enough money to feed his own self. He has to eat the slop and the corn cobs and the garbage that the pigs are eating. He has to eat that in order to live. And in that condition, he comes to himself and he says, I have to go back home. And he rehearses a speech. And you heard it read. He says... I'm going to go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So that's the snapshot of this younger son, little brother. The next snapshot we see is of the father. The father is the hero to the story. The Pharisees who are listening intently, they know this. And Jesus describes this father. And what really marks the father is he's full of wisdom, he's full of compassion, he's full of graciousness, and he's full of mercy. He knows things that his younger son doesn't know about life, and he, he's smart enough to know he's going to have to figure it out on his own. And he's praying, he's asking God, please let me have my son back after he's gone through this. The father, this father has no idea whether the son's going to come back. He has no idea. He has, he has no assurance that he's going to get back his son who was lost to his own self. Maybe some of you are in that condition as moms or dads today. That's an awful place to be in. I was in that place with my bride, with one of our daughters. She did come back. She did come to herself and came back. And we're able to report that 
that daughter today is living a life that's really worthwhile and fulfilling what God wants her to be. But she went through a period, not too unlike this, where for six or seven years we worried, where would we ever get this daughter back? And the father's got to be wondering that too. The reason I think the father has some money and he has some reach is what we read about him is he's standing, as it were, on the porch or even in the middle of the road, and he's waiting, watching for his son. He's watching for his son to come home. He's expectant that the son will come home. But there's an even bigger reason that the father's on the porch or in the road, and he's looking afar off. He probably has kept tabs on his son from a distance. He knows kind of where he is. He may have even heard that he's in desperate trouble. But dad is watching for the son. Why? This is your time. This is not a library. Why is the son, who's off in a faraway place, maybe known to the father, now he's ready to come back home because he's come to his senses, but why is dad so intent, watching, watching, looking as far out as he can for the son? Anybody know? I'm sorry? We always do, and once you're a parent, you're always a parent. You know, when, when it's little kids, it's little trouble. When they're bigger kids, it's bigger trouble, right? There's an even more compelling reason. I gave it away a little bit earlier. The father is on the porch, or he's out in the middle of the road. He's watching for his son because there's these roving bands. They're going to beat the tar out of his kid because that's what they do to people who step out of line. Just like they do in Muslim countries today if a woman goes out without her head covering on or she goes out without a male escort. It happened then in the Jewish population. The father has to, he's probably heard things, he's probably understanding that maybe my son is coming home now and he's watching, he's waiting. He has to get to his son before the mob does. These young misguided men who are at the, at the bidding of the Pharisees in their local synagogue, they're going to go beat him for being a highly disrespectful and cheeky son who brought dishonor and ill repute on the name of his father's house. They're going to go and take care of this son. And at the least, they're going to beat him. They may do something worse. The father is watching because he's got to get to the mob before they do. Do you get it? This is some kind of father here. This is a father who is not only wise and compassionate and understanding what the son is going to have to go and do before he comes to his senses. But he's an expectant father wanting to get to his son to protect him and bring him back in and reclaim him as his son. That's why the father is the hero to the story, which leaves us with the big brother. The big brother is the one who's running the farm, probably very profitably so. He's been a dutiful son. He's been a son who's fulfilled all of his father's obligations. He's a son that probably never gave his father or mother one minute's trouble. He was probably the model son. He probably was the son that the father would say to the younger boy before he left, why can't you be more like your big brother? How many of you heard that when you were growing up with your siblings? Or perhaps maybe you even said that to your kids when they were young. Well, the straightforward answer is, if you're the younger son, well, because I'm not him. That's why. <laughs> That's why I'm not like him, because I'm not him. The younger, the younger brother comes back home, and Dad throws a big party. He is so relieved that he has his son back, and a broken and repentant son at that. He's not crawling back without repenting of what he had done and being sorry for what he did and apologizing to his father. And when he sees his father, his father won't even let him finish the rehearsed speech that he prepared. He only gets as far as, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called his son. And the father says, Stop. I'm glad you're home you and I've missed you. Let's have a feast for him. Prepare some, prepare the roast beef or whatever it is they were going to, to eat. Put my signet ring on his finger. Put fine clothes on him. 
this is a day of rejoicing, and the older brother is seizing once he finds out. He is seizing with anger. All these years that he's done the right thing and never given mom and dad one minute's trouble probably, he's looking in this scene, and he is furious. Like, what is going on here? And the reason you know this is because of the the big and inflammatory words that he uses here. I'll quote some of them to you. The older brother became angry and refused to go in to the party, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father and said, Look! Now, in the original language, the way this comes out is, Look, Dad! Or if you were from Philadelphia, Yo, Dad! I mean, this is how he starts off. Look, Dad! And he takes off from there. And he uses words that are inflammatory. They are declarative. They are maximum words. Because he doesn't think that dad gets it. Look, dad, all these years I've been slaving for you. He doesn't say, I've been working for you all these years. No, no. He he ramps it up. I've been slaving for you. This is all bottled up in him. Probably he's not angry at being the dutiful son. He's angry because... He's done what was right, and the one who has done wrong is having the big party, and he's got nothing. All these years I've been slaving for you. It gets worse. I have never disobeyed you. This sounds like a husband and wife fight. Have you ever noticed with husbands and wives, maybe with your own selves, that you use words like always and never and you don't ever or you always do? Husband and wives do this. They, they use maximum words. We, we do those things because we're in the heat of the moment. And when we feel them, we feel them all the way down to our toes. And so we use these maximum over-the-top words to make our point. I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed you. I've done everything you wanted me to do. But when this son of yours... He can't even say my little brother. He can't even identify him by name. When this son of yours comes home, it reminds me of when I would come home from work at the end of the day when our kids were little, and my wife would meet me at the door with a smile, and and she would say, "Um, these daughters of yours need you to... She wouldn't call them by name either. These daughters of yours need you to go get this straightened out. The big brother does the same thing. Look, I've been slaving for you. you. You never did this for me. I never disobeyed you. And this son of yours, after he has squandered, how many have used that word lately? That's kind of a, a big descriptive word, isn't it? Doesn't it sound like what it is? Doesn't it sound like you've blown it all? But squandered just sounds so much more impressive. And, and he's in this big brother, man, he's mad. He's in full flight. This son of yours squandered your property. And you know what else, Dad, just in case you don't get it yet? He did it with prostitutes. He blew all your money on prostitutes and drugs and whatever else he wanted to to do. This is where this big brother is. He's really there. He's mad. And Dad never misses a beat. The hero father, the compassionate, wise gracious, kind father says, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. Here's the funny twist in all of this thing. The Pharisees are hearing this story and they're thinking, yeah, that that younger son, give it to him. It's a shame the father was watching, keeping him from the mob. He deserved to get beaten with what he did. That was awful. Doom on him. That's what the Pharisees are thinking. You know why? Because they're sitting there telling themselves, well, that's not us. We are the dutiful ones. We are the responsible ones. We are the ones trying to keep God's rules and regulations and instructing all of you to do that same thing. And to reinforce it, yeah, there's a mob or two that gets together and will harass you and give you a hard time if you don't obey. But we're not the younger son. We're not that. And yet what Jesus is impressing on them that we should get for our own selves 
And to their great horror, the Pharisees realize, wait a minute, the point of the story is not the younger son who repented and came home. The point of the story is the good son who always did what was right, who was full of duty and honor and obligation, and always did what dad wanted him to do, and worked hard, and helped make the farm into something that would be worth inheriting. Jesus is putting him on display and saying, the older son's attitude is like you Pharisees, and it's like too many of you who believe that you can make yourself righteous by doing these things, by keeping the law. And more than that, you're proud. You're proud because you're not the younger son. You're proud because you didn't run off and squander all this money. You're proud because you didn't waste it on drugs and wild women. You're proud, you're proud, you're proud, and what's in your heart is really awful. And you Pharisees and all of you who believe that, you're wrong. We call those legalists today. If I could have that next screen. What the older brother really represents is he represents all of us who are trying to do the right thing with life, who are full of duty and honor and obligation. Those are good things, by the way. Let no one leave here today saying that that we should not be dutiful or be obligated to do the right thing. We should. What Jesus is going after is not the actions of what the older brother was doing. He's going after his heart, believing that he was better than his younger brother, and he knew better than his father, who apparently didn't understand what the younger son was really doing. Jesus is going after the big brother and his spirit, and the Pharisees finally get it, and they don't like it. They're thinking, we're not the younger son, we're safe. And Jesus is saying, no. If you believe yourself to be better than other people because of the way you act, if you believe yourself to be smarter than other people, if you believe yourself to be more upright than other people, that you have the inside track on skill or knowledge or wisdom, and you're only too willing to share it with everybody to make them know how smart you are, or show off how dutiful you are by how much you're doing, and you're deriving your own sense of personal pride from that, and somehow your standing with God is better than somebody else, you're wrong. That's what Jesus is saying. And so really, the big brother represents me. I mean, I was kind of a, I was something of a wild hare when I was young, but once I got settled down and got married and got through Bible college and seminary, and I became respectable and dutiful and full of obligation and honor, and I did all those things. But if I wasn't careful, there were moments and there were times where I would look at people who were not doing what I was doing, and I wouldn't think good things about them. They made bad choices. They deserve to have happened to them what happened. Jesus is putting his very finger on that kind of those attitudes that are present in me when those things happen, and they happen very subtly. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be something like breaking Old Testament law. It comes down into something like this. You're seeing a family that doesn't earn as much as you do, and the car they drive isn't as nice as yours, and the house they live in isn't quite as nice as yours, or it's not kept as well as yours. And when you see that or you experience it or you're in their home or in their car or you're, when, when you're with them, you tend to think, well, that's not me. My wife and I work really hard. We saved our money. We, we didn't spend our money like they did, and we drive a little better, and we present ourselves a little better than other people, and, and our house is repaired and in good shape, and we are the pride of the, the neighborhood. It happens like that. You may not be depending on that for your eternal salvation, but inside, you're playing this part. If I could have the, the next screen. What this is really all about is grace versus legalism. Not the kind of legalism that says that if I keep all of these Old Testament laws, I'll go to heaven. It's the kind of legalism that says that I'm better than most people. I pay my taxes, I work hard, so does my spouse. We raised our kids. They never got into trouble. It was God's blessing on us to reward us for being such dutiful and respectful and obligated people. We're not like them. 
Well, the truth is, yes, we are. We may not have done all those things, but if you harbor in your heart that you're better than other people, that you know better than other people, it's a problem, and all of us will do it. As I look back over the arc of my life, I never thought I really was like that, neither as a pastor nor a person, until my oldest daughter got into trouble. And all those things that my wife and I believed, and by the way, this trouble didn't start until she was in her later 20s. We sailed right through the teenage years. Everything was fine. We sailed through the early 20s. Everything was fine. And aren't we such good parents? Didn't we get this all right? Dr. Dobson should be calling us to figure out how did we do this. And I found out the hard way that just because my bride and I tried to raise good children and we tried to do what God wanted us to do and live our lives the right way, there was no guarantee that we wouldn't have a child like this. And I found out the hard way that, yes, indeed, I had things in me that looked a lot more like this older brother. And that was what Jesus was picking at. 